Welcome to another edition of the Invisible Wheelchair Interview Podcast. I'm Donald Grodoff, family coach with FamilyOCD.com, FocusedHealthyFamily.com, and of course, InvisibleWheelchair.com. In the Invisible Wheelchair Interviews, I get the wonderful chance to interview some of the experts with obsessive compulsive disorders, professionals that treat OCD, people who are going through or have been through OCD, parents and caregivers of those suffering from OCD, and of course anyone that advocates for treatment of OCD. My goal of these interviews is to inform people on all aspects of OCD and bring about awareness of obsessive compulsive disorder. Please remember that I am not a doctor, therapist, or counselor, and the content, information, resources, and ideas that are talked about and brought up here in these interviews are not necessarily the views and opinions of myself, Family OCD, Focused Healthy Family, and Invisible Wheelchair Podcast. And I always recommend to seek additional professional help in finding solutions for yourself. You can find out more about me at FamilyOCD.com, FocusedHealthyFamily.com, and InvisibleWheelchair.com. This interview podcast was recorded May 8, 2018. Today I have the honor of introducing you to Rachel Feenstra, who is a mother advocating for her son's OCD. Rachel lives with her husband and four kids in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Her oldest is a boy, and then she has three girls. Her family enjoys animals, and they have a dog, eight chickens, and five guinea fowl. Her son was diagnosed with OCD in the fall of 2016, and since then she has been committed to helping him fight the OCD bully and spreading the awareness of OCD. Being a stay-at-home mom has afforded Rachel the time to start a blog about her family's journey through OCD. You can find her at www.ocdoffamilyjourney.com. That's www.ocdafamilyjourney.com. The journey with this illness is hard. But Rachel has learned so much about herself and her whole family through this process of fighting OCD. With that said, let's go to the interview now. So, Rachel, I want to welcome you to the Invisible Wheelchair Podcast, and I I really thank you for being part of this. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm excited to share my story. Well, thank you, Rachel. Now, what I'd like to do uh, for my audience to get more of a kind of a personal view of you is uh, ask you to kind of tell a little story about yourself, uh, how you got involved with OCD or what's going on with your family. So if you could share a story, that would be wonderful. Okay, sure. Um, I will start with talking about my son. He is the one who was diagnosed with OCD. We've always struggled with him, and we've gone to so many different places as he's grown older because we always knew that there was something going on, but we weren't sure what it was. We got several different diagnoses. In the end, we just still didn't feel like we had gotten to the bottom of who he was and what he was struggling with. But one particular summer that was really hard for us was when he was eight years old. He had always had a problem with his little sister ever since she was born. But we started to notice that he was getting to the point where he wouldn't even touch her. He didn't want to be around her. He acted very, very mean to her. We started to wonder what's going on here. By the end of the summer, he was at the point where he would spend a lot of the day in his bedroom just to get away from her. And I remember going to a doctor 
I asked the doctor, what do you think is going on here? We can't function like this as a family. And I said, do you think it could be OCD? And she said, no, OCD is more about germs and about keeping things perfectly clean and straight. She said, this is an OCD. And so at that point, I thought, yeah, okay, I guess it's not then. We just kind of decided at that point that we were going to try to start some medication. Once we started the medication, things got better for a couple years. When, uh, when did you then figure uh, that it was OCD, or how did you find out or come about with that it was OCD? Okay, so then it was a couple years later, and he had been on the medication for a while, and things had been going well. And it was another summer. We started to notice him retreating back into his bedroom again. We have a pool at this house. We had moved by then, and we have a pool. We noticed that he didn't want to swim in the pool ever, which we thought was odd for a, you know, 10, 11-year-old boy. So we thought, well, that's odd. What's going on here? So we started to just sort of pay more attention to him. And we noticed that things were getting really bad between him and his sister. Before, my husband had always gotten to the point where when he noticed that my son didn't want to be around his sister, he would make him touch something of hers, which now we know is ERP, but we didn't know it was ERP when we were doing it. So my husband started saying, okay, we need to expose him to her a little bit more now. And so he started to do that, and it got worse and worse. And instead of that helping, it got really bad. Finally, one night after he blew up on us because I had touched her and then I touched him, we got to the point where we said, okay, something is going on here, and we don't know what, but we can't live like this as a family. We need to do something about this. So then I scheduled an appointment met with a counselor who said, I think that maybe what you should do is you should get him tested for OCD just to see. So we went to a psychiatrist who did the testing, and we found out that, yes, he did have OCD. At that point, then, it was a matter of what do we do now. We thought it was pretty great when we learned more about ERP. We thought, wow, this is pretty cool that we've been doing this without even realizing it. But obviously, we're at the point now where we needed to go to a professional for help. So I went online, and Psychology Today has a really nice therapist finding tool. So I looked in there for a therapist that works with kids with OCD in our area. And I came up with about three or four of them, and I made several phone calls. And I just said to my husband, well, I guess the first one that calls back we'll go with. So that's what we did. The first one that called back we okay. went with, and he's been amazing. You then um, felt like you needed even more than that, and, and then you came about Rogers. Just for my audience sake, I uh, want to understand Rogers Behavioral Health Center. They specialize in OCD, but they also work with other disorders. There's locations all over the United States, and they're very well known in the OCD world uh, for OCD treatment and being able to handle, um, I guess you'd say, maybe a little tougher cases. Tell me what, it, what, what your reasoning was for co going to Rogers and then what it was like to actually bring your child to Rogers. Sure. So that was, it was a journey because we thought, oh, we'll, you know, start meeting with the therapist and things will go well and, you know, maybe four or five months from now we'll be doing really good. At that point, we didn't really know much about OCD. Since then, we've learned a lot. We realize that um, they're never going to quite be doing good. They'll just learn how to cope with it. So we started to see this therapist twice a week. Our son would not acknowledge that he had OCD. To get somebody to fight OCD is tough enough as it is, but to get them to fight it when they wouldn't even acknowledge that they had it and they thought they were completely fine, that's where it was like, okay, what do we do now? He was walking around school at this point with his arm covering his nose because he was so worried about all the contaminants that would get into his nose if he didn't cover his nose. And so we started talking to the therapist a little bit more about, well, what are we going to do if it's not working to meet twice a week? And that's when he brought up Rogers, and my heart just sank. And I remember thinking, I think we're going to have to do that. But I just, I wouldn't give up hope. After a few months of meeting with this therapist, he finally sat me down and he said, 
I think you need to at least look into it. You know, there's a wait list. So why don't you just look into it and see what you think? So I called them and went through the interview process and they said, yep, we definitely think that he should come here. We will put him on the wait list. So then it was just a matter of waiting. As we waited, I wouldn't give up hope. I kept thinking maybe, just maybe one of these days, he will admit he has it and he will want to fight it. That just didn't happen. We got to the point where um, Rogers ended up calling us and we said, you know what? Before that, I think we'd feel more comfortable trying a partial program. And so that was last summer. We ended up driving down to Chicago for four weeks straight, he and I, to do this partial program. After that, he was doing okay. We couldn't keep on, you know, driving like that. We couldn't keep on um, separating our family so much. It was just getting to be too much for me to be leaving every single week. I have three daughters, and my husband was trying to carry everything at home, and it just was getting too hard. We called Rogers back and said, okay, I think we're ready. And they said, okay, we will put you back on the list, and you'll get the next bed that opens up for boys. A couple weeks later, we got a phone call, and it was a Friday afternoon. They said, he can come Tuesday. <laughs> and we, <laughs> we were thinking, what, already? That is so fast, and there were so many things to get together. And so I asked if we could have a couple extra days. The following Thursday already, we were dropping him off at Rogers. That's a hard thing. You have to get to the point where your son or your, your daughter or your loved one is struggling so much with OCD that you know that this is the best thing for them. Because you don't just send them just like that. You have to try other things first. But we were just at the point where we're trying therapy twice a week. We've tried this partial program. Nothing's helping. It's getting worse. He is throwing these temper tantrums, things are, he was doing compulsions. He was proud of himself because he said one day, Mom, I did 1,500 compulsions today. So we thought, okay, something obviously needs to be done, and that's how we finally got to that point. But it is a hard decision to make. We ended up doing it. We drove him out there. We, when we told him, he said, well, you'll have to drag me, drag me kicking and screaming. We said, well, we just want you to understand we love you, and this is why we're doing this. But he couldn't understand that. I mean, he's 12. You know, it's going to be yeah. hard. Ended up getting to Rogers and going through the check-in process. Then you leave after that. They want you to leave as soon as possible. We got to that point. It was time to leave, and that was really hard. I can imagine that. Uh, I know the tough decisions we had to make. So, and it sounds like m my daughter was a little more cooperative in, in what you want to do. So I can only imagine with somebody that, that doesn't even believe they have it, how tough that would be for them. And then for you to have the pains that you have. What did he go through in Rogers? Uh, and, and did you believe it helped? What they end up doing is they pretty much do therapy all day long, which is why it's a residential program because they're doing therapy right away in the morning and they're doing it throughout the entire day. He had to still get to the point where he admitted that he had OCD. So that was the first thing that we had to try to do was get him to that point. So we ended up, we left, we went home and trusted that, you know, we'll just see what happens and see how this goes. We'll give it a few days and see what's happening. Well, it ended up being a really hard first two weeks. And for anybody that ends up sending their child there, that is one thing that everyone says. The first two weeks are the worst. They are so hard because you're just mourning having to leave your child at a place and leave him. You're feeling like you abandoned him. But yet you know at the same, on the, at the same token that this is the right thing for your child because there's absolutely no way a parent would just drop their child off somewhere mm. without knowing. With 100% yeah. certainty that it's the right thing for them. They started to work with him and really weren't getting very far at all. I remember coming to visit him, I think it was two weeks in. We went to visit him for the first time, or maybe it was the second time, but we went into a meeting room 
and waited for him to come in there with us. And he walked in there, and he was white as a ghost and wouldn't even acknowledge us. And at that point, we were like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Our yeah. poor child. That was really hard. We decided we have to just keep on trying. They are well known. Um, everyone talks about what a wonderful program they are. And his family therapist kept telling us, trust the process, trust the process. My mother's heart was breaking, yeah. but I had to. We just had to trust it. I take it that changed over time that he, he came around to uh, understanding or, or believing that he had it. Is that true? Yes, and that's the interesting thing was that was one thing that we said, if we only get that out of the program, we've gotten somewhere. Yeah. So that was, that was pretty exciting to us. It took a while, though. I believe we sent him there mid-October. We came out for Thanksgiving weekend the next month. My husband and I, we drove away after that weekend thinking, wow, that was a good weekend. We can see a little bit of improvement in him. And before that, we hadn't seen anything. We thought, okay, something seems to be clicking. After being with him for that weekend, we said, okay, we're starting to see something, and that's when we thought, okay, this actually might be worth it. But it took a month, a whole month, for us to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And things weren't easy for them. He wasn't giving them anything until the week before Thanksgiving when they decided, okay, you know what? Nothing's happening. He's been here a whole month. We need to flood him. So flooding him meant basically taking his sister's things that we had sent along for the exposure therapy and rubbing it all over every single surface in the living area and then also rubbing it all over his bedroom. So they talked to us on the phone and they said, we think we have to do this. And that was another bad day. I remember getting off the phone from that meeting because we gave them permission and thinking, my son is five hours away, and they are doing something to him that, to him, is torture. And I can't be there for him. And that was really hard. But we knew something had to be done. Otherwise, we knew we'd take him home and things would just be the same way. They told us to try to keep in touch with him that day, see how things were going. They warned us that sometimes when they do that, kids do have to go inpatient because they sometimes will lose it on the therapist. Things went okay when they flooded him for us. He screamed at them. He was angry at them. It went okay as far as by the end of that day, after I had called him several times and told him how much we loved him and how we hate this just as much as he does, he actually at the end of that last phone call said, I love you, Mom. And I thought, whoa, okay. Wow. Yeah. wow. <laughs> We're getting somewhere. Where has it gone now from where he's at Rogers? How has it gone? Where did he end up there? And then how, did, how is it going now? So, yeah, so after that Thanksgiving weekend, we had a lot of hope. And the next several weeks were basically dedicated to get him, getting him home. Because I had always said from the day that we dropped him off there, I said, I want my son home for Christmas. And I understood that that's not possible. You can't just say, well, he's coming home now because it's Christmas. But that was our goal. And for me to send my son there, I had to have a goal. For me, the goal was Christmas. And so they looked at me that first day, and they had said to me, don't expect that. But I wouldn't give up. I wouldn't stop believing that he could be. After Thanksgiving weekend, we were pretty excited. And as time went on, Throughout the next few weeks, he started to do more and more things until the point where mid-December they called us and they said, you need to start traveling out here with your daughter. He needs to actually have contact with her instead of just with her things. So for two weeks straight, my daughter and I went out there. We, we would go, you know, at the beginning of the week and come home at the end of the week. We stayed at the Ronald McDonald House that's in Milwaukee, and we would travel there every day and he would do exposures with her. That was in the morning that they did their ERP time. They had two hours every morning that they do their ERP time. So we would make sure to be there on time for that. 
and we would do exposures together. Well, we got to the point where he actually um, cooked something with her in their kitchen, and then after that, he actually took a bite of it, and that was like amazing, <laughs> amazing. Mm -hmm. I almost cried, but I was trying to play it cool because <laughs> he got a little annoyed with my, you know, what's the word, the, mo the mom emotions. So yeah. I was like, oh, cool, okay, yeah. But inside, <laughs> yeah, you're jumping for joy. You know. Exactly. So then, um, so then I talked to them and I said, I still would love to have them home for Christmas. We have an amazing therapist waiting at home. This therapist is, you know, he's he's great at what he does. He knows ERP, and that is so important. If you do not have a therapist that does ERP, you're it. It's just not good for OCD. Yeah. That is just such an important. Uh, therapy to be working with. So we said, um, I have three kids at home and a husband at home, and my daughter is missing school, and we just can't keep on doing this to our entire family. So we said, I think, you know, what are your thoughts? And they said, you know what, with how good he's done, we think we're ready to send him home by Christmas. We got to take him home for Christmas, Yay. and that was the best Christmas ever. <laughs> uh, yeah. It was great. How did he do over Christmas then? Christmas go normal or did was it still some some issues with it went really well. I think it was like the honeymoon phase. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> everyone's just happy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he was so happy to be home and he was so sweet to his sister and to his other sisters too, which he's never had problems with them anyway. It's just the the one sister. It really went well. And they had said to us, we just want you to know, I mean, you're probably going to see regression. It's just a matter of fact thing. Just expect it mm -hmm. and don't freak out when it happens. So we didn't actually start seeing that until January. So that was kind of nice. We had a little honeymoon phase. Mm -hmm. And then, again, I mean, thinking about what he had been like before, even when we did start seeing a little regression in January, it was like, oh, well, that's nothing compared to what we had gone through before. Yeah. So we just um, got to the point where we were taking him to a therapist twice a week, and his therapist helped us work out an ERP schedule. He started getting to the point where he started to actually kind of take control of his own therapy schedule, which was super helpful because it meant not only did he admit he had OCD, but he knew he had to fight it. I think when they finally had flooded him at Rogers, I think was the point in time where he finally lost his will to fight it. I think he always knew he had it, but would not accept it. And when they flooded him, it was like, it was just finally too much. And he yeah. had lost his will. And he, he knew something had been done. Yeah, by, by this time in you know, mid to end January, he's actually at the point where he says, I know I have OCD. And... I am going to help with my therapy, and I'm going to do exposures because I want to get past it. Another proud moment for mom, huh? For sure. Uh, jump forward to right now. Where would you say you are right now with it? So right now I would say we are not as far along as we would probably hope to be, but yet when you have – I have diary – from back, I had journaled back in last year during the first few months of 2017. And when I look at those compared to now, I think, okay, we're doing good. He's actually at the point where he will touch me after I've touched her. He will touch her for exposures. He's not at the point where he will touch her in just everyday life and be super thrilled about it. <laughs> but yeah. he knows he has to do it for exposures, and he does it. He willingly does his exposures. We're just at the point where we feel like a therapist in town is helping, and we are just going to keep on slowly but surely fighting this. Well, that sounds, <clears throat> again, in comparison to the beginning, it sounds very good. So, And it sounds like he's on a good road. You've had the Rogers experience. I have not. I, I would love to know some of the lessons you believe you've learned that you could pass along to those that are maybe in that position you were back at the beginning 
what would you say to them about Rogers, about OC any of the lessons you feel like you've learned? That maybe it's about Rogers, maybe not. Yes, we've definitely learned a lot about OCD. A couple of things that I would say. First of all, I would say for anybody who doesn't quite understand what it's like, OCD is an all-consuming thing, and it is something that takes over an entire family. It doesn't just affect the person who lives with it or who has it, but it also affects the entire family, and it can wreak havoc and definitely needs to be dealt with. We learned early on, as a family member, you are not allowed to accommodate. And a lot of times with OCD, what family members do is it's easier to accommodate and help them with their compulsions because then if you do that, it'll go away for a few minutes. But we learned actually accommodating is feeding into it. Mm -hmm. So that was a lesson that we learned through this whole process. As far as people who are considering Rogers, I would say that I'm probably not the best person to ask because <laughs> I, even though they helped us so tremendously, it was just really hard, and that part is still for in the, at the front of my mind. Mm. But yet, on the other hand, you have to put all that aside, yeah. and you have to realize that they really do help. I'm on a Facebook group of parents who've had kids at Rogers or currently are at Rogers, and every single person says they saved my child's life. When you get to the point where you can't live the way you're living anymore, then it's really worth looking into, but it's going to be really hard. One thing that I think would help is if you had a outgoing child, because our son, it turns out, we, we knew he was not outgoing, but he really, he didn't flourish in this kind of an atmosphere. He didn't enjoy the nights with the kids, you know. He didn't really want to make friendships and stuff, whereas, you know, a lot of the girls, I would see them, if, if I was visiting, I would see, you know, they'd be painting each other's fingernails and, you know, doing things like that. Some kids flourish. They love that time. Obviously, it's hard for anybody. Some kids do okay as well as that goes, as far as that goes, but our son just is not a social person, which we actually ended up finding out after he got discharged from Rogers. We had some further testing done. We found out he is just um, on the autism spectrum. So that explains to us why yeah. socially he had a really hard time there. Yeah. But in the end, yes, it is. It will help your child. There's no doubt about that. But it's going to be really hard. What well, the last thing I'd, I'd like to do for you, Rachel, is um, if you'd like to, if somebody was interested in learning more about you or, or somehow maybe getting in contact with you, uh, what's their best method for doing that? Because I believe you have a podcast you, or a podcast blog that you do, correct? Yes, that's correct. I decided after learning all the things that I learned about OCD that there needs to be more awareness because you hear a lot of people using the, the term, I'm so OCD. <laughs> oh. And, oh, <laughs> yeah, I know I, that one too. I get kind of <laughs> flustered by that myself. Yes, and it didn't used to bother me, but now it bothers my son, so now it bothers me. Uh, he says, Mom, they don't even know. Yeah. They don't even know what it is to be OCD. And so, yes, there needs to be more awareness because think back to when he was eight and the doctor said to me, no, I don't think it's OCD. That is a doctor who is telling me this. There needs yeah. to be more awareness out there. And so I decided the first thing that I would do to spread awareness is start a blog. So you can find me at www.ocdafamilyjourney.com. And you can contact me through there. And I'll also have that up there for my audience to find on the uh, Invisible Wheelchair podcast site and also on the familyocd.com site. So that information up there, I'll also, I'm going to look up the Facebook group and put a post on that too because I think, I, I, I believe very much in, that's why I'm doing this and the same thing you're talking about, getting the awareness out, finding resources because I'm sure you probably found at the, at the beginning of this, not know, even knowing what it is and then what to do, where to go, who to turn to. Uh, is that, would that be correct for you too? Yes, I would say for sure. Um, you can't just go to just any therapist. Because yeah. 
traditional talk therapy does not work with OCD. It yeah. just doesn't. Um, traditional talk therapy feeds more into it. And so you need, yes, definitely there needs to be more information out there for parents who are finding out that this is what they're dealing with. And they need to understand that, you know, ERP is the gold star treatment for OCD. If you're not doing ERP, you're not really doing anything, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. That the, there's a OCD treatment center here in Charlotte, and the, the doctor there, Dr. Jericho, in fact, he, I've interviewed him on this podcast. He said that he, he, he insists on all his, anybody that comes in, they need to be doing ERP if, you know, unless, unless they refuse. Well, Rachel, I very much appreciate you being part of this. It's been a very good conversation. You really, especially in talking about Rogers, because I had not had that on here yet. So I very much appreciate that, and thank you for being on here. Thank you so much for having me. And one last thing, if I may. Sure. I'd like to share that I um, came across you online and found out about the Invisible Wheelchair podcast. And I just have to say what an awesome name that is. I just think that's great to say it like that because that is one thing that I think with mental health issues, people can't see it. Yeah. And it's very easy for people to make judgments and it's easy for them to say, oh, well, you know, maybe that parent just needs to discipline more or something. You know what? <laughs> yeah. I, we had a we had a a doctor we were working with that told us that we were just not good parents and we needed to put a little more structure and discipline in that girl. That's which so just, awful. Which just about you know, I I I almost had to be held back a little bit on that one. Uh, so sure. yeah, and you know, like you said, thank you for that. I appreciate that that little uh, testimony or whatever you want to call it, because I it was very true for us is that. If, if, if we could have got my daughter out in, in public during her worst time, you wouldn't have been able to tell it. You wouldn't know anything was wrong, you know, and because that's one thing I think about OCD is that people that have OCD tend to, I don't want to say lie about it, but they tend to cover it up. They, they tend to find any way they can to hide the, the symptoms and hide the compulsions and all of that. So, yes. Yeah. Very true because my son thought if I if I hide it maybe my parents won't make me fight it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah. Yes, they do. And you know what? Another thing too is in public they they hide it really really well. Oh but yeah. Oh my when gosh. They come yes. home, well, that's when. <laughs> that's when the terror begins. That's when <laughs> it's our safe place, which is yep. good. They need to have a, a safe place, and I'm glad that he felt that he could be loved and accepted by us no matter how he acted because we saw the ugly and oh yeah but you know what we loved him through it all and well we always tell him we would do anything for him and I hope someday he grows up and says wow my parents really loved me they were willing to do that well you know one thing I used to say to my daughter I think I still get uh, kind of uh, emotional about it and she's doing really well right now so but mm -hmm. I used to look at it and say um, well, I used to use um, Harry Potter right. as um, as kind of a saying, you're Harry Potter and that's Voldemort. And you know what, what saved Harry Potter was the love of his mother. Yep. And I said, you ha I, I would tell you, you have love, which OCD does not. And that's what's going to save, that's what's going to be the power that's going to break this. Exactly. That is so true. And, and, and my son is a huge Harry Potter fan. So we did try that. They they say to name OCD so that you're not, it's not you have OCD, it's there's an OCD bully. Yeah. And you want to get rid of the OCD bully um, or never really get rid of it, but you want to learn how to fight it. And yeah. uh, we tried that. We tried to do the Voldemort thing, but <laughs> he wasn't thrilled about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, yeah, it took her a little while to, to take that on. But, yeah, I mean, she didn't fight it when we said it, but she didn't take it on right away. But eventually she did. But I always, I always came back with the, the thing that's going to be your strength, your strength is your love. And that was always, you know, I thought that was, a, for her, I think that was a pretty powerful message. So That is very true.
Yeah. Well, we we could talk about this. I could talk about it all day. So uh, uh, once again, I just want to thank you. Uh, it's been an enjoyable conversation. I appreciate you being on the podcast. Thank you so much. That concludes this interview podcast. Please leave me a comment or question below. That gives me good direction where to go on future podcasts and interviews. I would love to hear your Invisible Wheelchair stories if you are willing to share it. If you would go to InvisibleWheelchair.com and click on Tell Your Story. I want to remind you that OCD, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, is treatable. I can help you get past OCD. So, if you have heard this interview podcast and other podcasts, and you feel like you need further assistance and would like to spend some time with me working through any issues you have, then feel free to book a session at FocusedHealthyFamily.com or FamilyOCD.com or call me at 704-562-1630. I also offer $85 off of your initial discovery session if you mention that you heard it on this podcast. I hope you enjoyed this interview podcast and will join me for the next one. Remember, keep tapping, talking, and transcending your life to new heights. Thank you, and have a great day.